Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Compensation Insider. Today, um, I want to talk about a story which I already published a few years, and it has generated a lot of engagement uh, with uh, the, the readers of the blog. So I want to tell you uh, uh, what I wrote about in this uh, in this article, and you'll find it uh, um, also on the, on the website. So <clears throat> this was a post that I wrote about um, um, me facing unemployment in my life, and um, at the time I was reacting to one of my uh, colleagues. Um, um, who had written a blog post about unemployment in the Arab world and how it was sometimes, you know, um, socially um, loaded, you know, bad, badly perceived. And he was asking for feedback on experiences and I was sharing mine. So here's my story. So basically in my life, I've had three periods, mo mostly where I was unemployed. So the first one was at, right at the beginning of my career. When I graduated from my business school with my specialization in HR, um, it turns out that I graduated in a year where there was a mini recession in France. And when I had entered the school, each graduate had a minimum of four offers even before graduating, four job offers before graduating. Um, and when I graduated, the average waiting time was six months to receive one offer. So the situation was not very good. And obviously, like everybody else, you know, who just graduated from, from school, I was eager to prove myself. But um, it was a very, very uh, different uh, market at the time. Uh, there was, you know, no social media, no LinkedIn, no bait, no monster, no golf talent or anything. You had to uh, read uh, uh, about a job offer in a website or maybe a, a, a magazine and then send a handwritten motivation letter uh, by mail with a, a copy of your CV attached. So it was a very slow process. It was an expensive process because I can tell you, if you're spending a lot of letters, it costs a, a lot of money in stamps and so on and time. And the challenge was uh, that the situation was very similar as of today uh, in the sense that people wanted candidates that had experience, not like me. I had like four internships in very prestigious organizations, but uh, they were interested with people with work experience. And they also were interested in people who were currently working, not currently unemployed. So it was good for me as a uh, former student to be living with my parents uh, financially, but that also increased the pressure in a way because after a while, what happens is that your parents start to think maybe it's your fault that you're not getting a job. Uh, are you too picky? You should take anything, you know, and just do it, even if it's not what you chose to do. And I, my parents were, my dad especially, was telling me that a lot uh, at the time. And I was like, first of all, I did not specialize in HR to do something else. And second, it's not that I'm getting offers uh, to do something else than HR. If, if I don't even get in what I'm, I'm already starting to specialize, I can't even get uh, in, uh, in another field. So uh, there was also pressure because at the time, you know, we're talking uh, 1993. Um, it was not very common, so people were thinking, you know, what will our friends think if my child is not successful and so on. So that was the first time and then eventually one company gave me a chance and the rest is history, here I am. So then um, I, throughout my career, most of the time when I left a job that was of my own volition, I was resigning to take another uh, job opportunity somewhere else. But um, actually, I had two periods of time where I lost the job uh, unwittingly. So the first one, I was in this um, telecoms for airlines company, and then 9-11 happened. And uh, obviously, when you're working for the airline industry after 9-11, when nobody wants to be on a plane, that's not really good. So uh, I was an expat at the time. Uh, I was uh, working in the UK, and I lost uh, the job. 
The second time I lost my job was in Dubai. Uh, it was in 2009 when the global financial crisis finally hit the region. Um, uh, I lost the job alongside uh, most of the employees in the headquarters of the company I was working at at the time. So how I reacted to both of those experiences was quite different. In 2001, you know, I did not panic. I was a 30 year old. I was single. I didn't have, you know, financial responsibility to take care of my kids. I had good skills. The crisis was just in one industry, which was related to the airline. So um, I took a little bit of time off and eventually I got the job. Um, I took the job of company band manager for EMEA for Apple, and uh, it ended up being a blessing in disguise when I, now when I look back, because I was on a very comfortable path of being um, um, a regional company band person in mid-sized organizations, and I would have probably, you know, changed companies, but kept being a regional uh, HR manager, you know, uh, or uh, not HR manager, company band manager or analyst or whatever you want to call it um, as an individual contributor. And that actually in 2001, the move to Apple led me eventually to take on leadership roles because in Apple, I was the Company band manager, so I was making decisions for my region at a higher level than what I was doing before. And by moving to the tech world instead of the telecom world, um, I was exposed to more modern ways of working and so on. So that was actually uh, quite good for me. Um, in 2009, the situation was different. Um, I had to leave the country. I didn't do, want to do what we call the visa runs at the time, which was, you know, like go to Oman, come back with a tourist time, stay for another, for another few months. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I always felt those were shady, plus there were some family situations that I needed to tend to back home. But also, uh, it was a global crisis. So that was quite different from 2001. Um, and the people who were uh, still employed at that point in time were not really moving, you know, everybody was scared of losing their job. So everybody was staying put, those who had the job were hanging on to it, you know, for dear life. And um, I could really see a big difference is that it was as if the people who still had the job did not want to talk to those who didn't have a job because they were afraid that it would be like kind of contagious uh, being unemployed. And I saw also a lot more of pitying in a way um, because everyone was aware that this was a global crisis, that it was difficult to find a job and there were no really openings happening up, happening, happening. So uh, it was difficult to get like concrete help from, from somebody. Now, in my uh, story, I already knew that I wanted to create my company. So I kind of used that time to focus on learning new skills, such as, I don't know, creating my business uh, plan, thinking of marketing, what kind of services I would sell, trying to find some clients and so on. But I felt that um, uh, even in my family, a, a lot of people were saying, oh, she's saying I want to be a consultant because she wants to cover for the fact that she's not employed uh, and she's in denial. And so I felt there was much more of a social toll uh, on it in the second time that I was uh, uh, let go than the, the first time. Now, I quickly realized that I was back in France, in Nantes, in the countryside, and I wanted to create my company in the Middle East because I had really enjoyed my work with uh, Majid al Futaim, and I wanted to stay in the region. And I could not really do that from France. I would not find clients in the Middle East where my experience would be valued. So what happened is that eventually I got an opportunity to come back to the region. And so I decided to postpone my plan to set up my company, take the corporate job, go back to the UAE, complete my experience in the region, and then set up my company, which is eventually uh, what I did. I just did it in 2013 instead of doing it in 2009. But that was uh, it. As uh, an expat, I would say that the experience 
showed me that there is additional pressure in the GCC, in the Gulf countries, um, because um, it's absolutely normally not possible to stay if you don't have a visa, if you're not sponsored by your employer. And I can say that when we saw the crisis uh, of 2020 with the COVID, I saw that the government in the UAE has learned a lot because when they gave people the chance to stay until the end of 2020, even if their visa had expired and they wouldn't have to pay fines and everything, that was a really, really smart move on the part of the government to say, hey, we have some people who have skills, who have experience, they're here. We might have that as well let them stay here for a little while anyway. At that point in time, in the beginning of the crisis, all the borders were closed. But let those people stay without having to pay a fine and maybe they can find another job and we won't lose that talent. So that was really a good thing that the government has learned in the region. Um, but the normal way is that if you lose your work, you lose your contract. And when you don't have the visa, how do you stay? Plus, um, one of the major differences between the GCC and, let's say, the Western uh, world, and especially uh, in Europe, is that there is no such thing as an unemployment scheme or even some kind of emotional um, uh, system or support. So no financial support when you end up uh, without a job, no uh, uh, support. Um, and a lot of times people feel extra pressure because they're supporting a whole family uh, ecosystem back in their home country. Uh, especially for those uh, who are not coming from, from uh, Europe tend to send a lot of money back home. So uh, they felt a lot more pressure. So um, I would say though, that out of all this, uh, let's say chaos and social burden of the unemployment, um, one small thing um, has uh, emerged, which is positive. The, I feel that the word unemployed is not as shameful as it used to be. Um, there is a widespread unemployment. And so society at large now is putting less of a moral judgment on the personal qualities or the supposed defaults of the of the person who's unemployed. You know, if you look at um, uh, countries in the GCC where the national youth, um, uh, like in Saudi Arabia, has a, a massive unemployment, it can't be because they're all, you know, um, lazy, not educated, clueless, bad, or whatever, or that they did something wrong at work and that's why they don't have a job. So I think that society now accepts that being unemployed does not necessarily mean that you were incompetent at your job or you did something legally or morally wrong and that's why you were terminated. And we've seen that shift. Um, I would say during the COVID crisis, because I feel that compared to the 2008-9 crisis, uh, what we see is a lot more solidarity between people, a lot more support, uh, a lot more acceptance on the part of hiring um, managers about why people might have stopped to work and so on. And so, um, uh, even though we still have that kind of uh, pressure uh, to social pressure to make money and uh, uh, we tend to define our identity through a job, um, I still find that the moral stigma of being uh, unemployed and the kind of personal values and behaviors that uh, might have been in the past associated, negative ones that might have been associated with being unemployed in the past is starting to recede and uh, become less, uh, less important and uh, less uh, visible in the uh, society. And I think it's a good thing. And I hope that by sharing my story, uh, which a lot of people think that, uh, you know, I have a, a good career, um, I've been head, global head of performance and reward at two large multinationals. Uh, I've been a consultant since 2013 now, yet um, that's what people see. Uh, they don't necessarily see that I might not have had uh, such a good uh, uh, experience at times. And uh, yeah, you can have a good career and have some times where things are not as easy and it's still good. So I hope that uh, 
if at the moment you're struggling to find a job and so on, that this will give you hope. And uh, um, I'm always open to discuss with anybody. So don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'm here and I will try to help. I can't find you a job most likely, but I try to help in um, any way that I can. Thank you so much and see you next week. Bye.